In this video, we are going to look over another of the giants of Battletech, and one of the original unseen faces of the franchise. Originally based around and licensed from Macross's Tomahawk, this design was striking and noticed at first glance by an extraordinary number of fans during the 1980s, in the first major era of the franchise. Paired with its equally, if not more famous stablemate, the Marauder, this mech was center stage until it simply vanished visually from all materials one day in the 90s. References to it remained, but no sign of the mech was seen in technical readouts, source books, or reference sheets on novels. Where it was was only a black outline. It had become one of the unseen. It would return to the forefront of the franchise once redesigned, first appearing originally in the MechWarrior reboot trailer, before another design appeared for Piranha Games' MechWarrior Online. Today, we are going to do an overview of one of the first true Lords of War, the Warhammer. A heavy mech weighing in at 70 tons, the Warhammer was designed and constructed in the 26th century and would begin to walk off the assembly line in 2515. Something akin to its design was requested by the Star League and its military arm, the SLDF, or Star League Defense Forces. More specifically, this requisition was made by General Sternson and had clear aims for what it was to achieve. To quote the original TRO 3025 source, Sternson's requisition called for a mobile mech with enough firepower to destroy or severely damage any mech of the same weight class or lower. This request would be received by Star Corps Industries, who would immediately begin the process of designing what would become one of the most recognizable war machines in the history of the Inner Sphere and beyond. The end result, of course, would be the Warhammer Heavy Battle Mech, or the WHM series of machines. These 70-ton giants would stride into the service of the SLDF and would become a favorite for pilots in quick order. In fact, often it would be found that this mech would be the choice of the best pilots in the entirety of the League, namely the Gunslingers. Gunslingers were an elite cadre of warriors from the SLDF, trained to be the best of the best, mech aces, essentially, and were renowned for their abilities. In fact, the first success of a gunslinger during the undeclared war by the Draconis Combine was a draw by one Colonel Donovan Fresnel of the 75th Royal Hussars Regiment, who would fight a stunned Combine elite warrior with his own warhammer while battling a new, cutting-edge marauder to a standstill, something which had never been achieved by the SLDF up until this point. The Warhammer's worth would be tested time and again throughout the Star League in low-level conflicts, but it would always prove itself to be the machine which General Sternson had originally commissioned. Warhammers would play a key role in the SLDF upon the conflict with Stefan Amaris, the madman who killed the Royal Cameron Dynasty, and who occupied the heart of the Star League, the Terran Hegemony. This mech would be pressed into service on both sides, with destruction and death raining down around them, as the most calamitous battle in history raged around the now ruins of an interstellar empire. Only after the war was won, and Amaris and his own family were scourged from the inner sphere for the crimes, would you see the beginning of a branching of the Warhammer in its design. One would find its home in the inner sphere, and the other would find its home and evolution far beyond. Those loyal to the SLDF, with the Star League dead and in ruins, would leave the Inner Sphere in hopes that their weapons would not be turned on the citizens who they swore to protect in the immense war they all saw coming. What would become the First Succession War? Many of the elite, those who remained of the Gunslingers, would depart with Kerensky's Exodus fleet, 
and the Warhammer would travel with them. Sadly, seeing conflict emerging even here as they did battle in the Pentagon Wars and what would become the clans would take these beasts into battle themselves. With time, this design would be refined into a new advanced version of the original, though this video will not be covering that design. In the Inner Sphere, the Warhammer would continue to be produced and would be used in the horror that would emerge as the Inner Sphere destroyed itself in a cauldron of violence. Nuclear weapons, battle mechs, tanks, infantry, aerospace assets, and just about every weapon system imaginable were thrown into this nightmare as the Inner Sphere tore itself apart. In the carnage and violence, its production facilities would survive, though they would be crippled and only able to produce a few machines per year across the Inner Sphere. As a result, the Warhammer would survive the conflict, looming over the absolute destruction it participated in. The design would often attract the best warriors, its reputation preceding it, though there were no gunslingers now, only remnants of armies that had once been great and grim soldiers for hire. As the succession wars would drag on, the Warhammer would partake in every major battle and conflict of note. It would also be fielded by every great house. In the latter stages of this, however, it's worth noting that a unit would make an appearance known as the Wolf's Dragoons. This organization was in fact a recon and intelligence group for the self-exiled warriors of the Star League, now the clans. Of all of them, one would become the most famous mech warrior in the history of the Inner Sphere, the Black Widow, Natasha Kerensky. As an aside, I feel it's important to do a quick diversion from the story of the Warhammer itself. The Black Widow's time is a part of the machine's history. Few mech warriors have been as accomplished, and few mech warriors have been as feared as Natasha Kerensky. The very history of the Inner Sphere was altered by Natasha in her Warhammer. As a Dragoon, she would fight under Duke Anton Merrick during the revolt against his brother, Captain General Janos, and inevitably, her and the Dragoons suffered his betrayal. The Widow would turn on this would-be Captain General in kind and killed him for the death of her lover and fellow Dragoon, Joshua Wolf. Her own personal unit became almost detached from the Dragoons as well, operating semi-independently and became known as the Black Widow Company. Later, they became the Black Widow Battalion, as she developed into a more and more infamous mech warrior with time, mostly while piloting the Warhammer she became associated with. Much like the gunslingers of the Star League's past, Natasha saw in the Warhammer what was needed for a heavy mech in the wars and duels she found herself in, and would exploit the machine to its maximum effect, becoming more and more dangerous with every passing raid, battle, or campaign. Such fear followed her name and the visage of her black Warhammer that the mystique she carried with her throughout her remaining time in the Inner Sphere meant that few with their sanity in check sought to fight her, and the very sight of her battle mech could make units break. Natasha Kerensky may be one of the greatest mech warriors to have ever lived, but there is a reason why the WHM series was chosen consistently by pilots of such high quality, including the Black Widow. The primary configuration of this Peacebringer turned Warlord during the Star League era and Succession Wars is Star Corp's original design, the WHM-6R. There are a series of quirks which the Warhammer receives in its original configuration that goes beyond just what it's equipped with. When playing with the advanced rules, these are additional benefits the WHM series typically have, barring notes to the contrary for specific models. To begin with, it's worth noting that the entirety of the Warhammer's targeting system is tied into a specialized searchlight, giving it a better ability to track targets in night engagements. This results in the Warhammer receiving the searchlight quirk. This allows the mech to illuminate a target when engaged in night fight scenarios to reduce penalties for fighting at night. Due to its hardy and resilient design, it doesn't need to be maintained as often while still being able to perform adequately on the battlefield. In addition to this, it also has been built for so long and remains in production 
meaning that when it does need to be repaired, parts are typically more readily available. The inherent durability of the design means it receives the rugged 2 quirk, which means when played in campaign with advanced rules, it can go three times as long as normal without needing maintenance. In addition to that, it has the ubiquitous trait, meaning that parts are easier to find when repairing them, also for the purpose of a campaign. To add to this, the Warhammer as a platform is considered rock solid in terms of its ability to be piloted with relative ease. So much so that it has received the stable trait, meaning attempts to knock it over with physical attacks are not likely to succeed. When it comes to mobility and movement, the Warhammer fits into the standard template one would expect for a heavy mech of its weight. The WHM-6R comes with a VOX 280 standard fusion engine which weighs in at 16 tons, giving it a maximum speed of 64.8 kilometers per hour. To put this engine's power into perspective, the same model of engine is employed inside the 40-ton ASN-21 Assassin, which allows it to move a shocking 118 kilometers per hour. This is to say, the 280 VOX is a serious, powerful engine, and its impressive power is needed to move this 70-ton Herculean machine across the field. It's important to stress in the era it was designed for, the Succession Wars and Star League era, 64 kilometers per hour is the standard anticipated speed for many medium and heavy mechs. In addition, this is the anticipated speed for what amounts to strategic mobility for battle-ready forces. This speed doesn't harm it against its standard anticipated resistance. It may not be able to outmaneuver light mechs or faster mediums, but it's not so slow that it ends up helpless in the face of their ambushes, flanking maneuvers, or other positions or attacks. A savvy pilot will keep the Warhammer's speed and resources at hand in mind when tackling light brawlers and skirmishers, though this of course doesn't make it impervious to faster opponents. When engaging slower targets, the Warhammer can use the benefit of its speed and long-range weapons to keep targets at bay. Given a lack of ammunition dependency for this, the Warhammer in theory can erode many of its would-be killers and those it can't defeat in ranged engagements. It has a real chance of using its own speed to outmaneuver these obstacles. There is a real virtue in moving the standard speed. A pilot and a mech commander simply need to understand their advantages and limitations. As we move into the Warhammer's more offensive abilities, it's important to first touch on what allows it to carry the deadly reputation that it does. As far as heavy mechs are concerned, in the original technical readout 3025, only one mech has more ability to disperse heat. Equipped with eight additional tons of heat sinks, this gives the WHM-6R the impressive ability to sink 18 points of heat every single turn of operation. This very impressive cooling management makes it able to exploit the dangerous weapon systems the Warhammer has access to. In order to comply with General Sternson's request, the WHM-6R needed to be outfitted with a diverse array of aggressive systems, giving it the edge over its adversities in most situations, and it does deliver on this, helping explain its consistent popularity with mech warriors and aces of its time. There is a reason it needed to be equipped with such advanced cooling abilities, after all. To start with, the Warhammer's primary weapons are a pair of Donal Particle Projection Cannons. These are equipped in its right and left arms, giving it a wide range of area that it can open fire in the direction of, and, if needed, giving it the chance to shoot a PPC straight behind it, should the mech be fully operational. The twin PPCs are slightly hotter than its overall heat sinking capacity in one turn, but not so much so that firing both in a single round will lead to the Warhammer suffering any immediate penalties for doing so. This means that these weapons need to be used carefully. Cycling out one PPC every round or two of fire in order to prevent negative heat effects on the mech, and in order to give it breathing room should it need to access its other array of deadly systems. Often mechs such as the WHM are thought of as PPC boats, much like the vaunted AWS-8Q Awesome, 
where the main thing the mech has to its name is the ability to fire its PPCs. And the PPC boat itself may suffer the consequences should someone actually close with them. Closing with the WHM 6R, however, may in fact be a fatal mistake for many light, medium, or even damaged heavy mechs, who simply think they can overpower and knock out this destroyer of mechs. For short proximity engagements, the Warhammer comes with a dangerous array of close quarters weapons, in many ways making it one of the most armed heavies in all of Battletech in just the sheer array of offensive options at its disposal. Once its opponent closes to 210 meters or 9 hexes in game, the Warhammer will begin having the ability to deploy its Holly short range missile pack with six tubes, which is mounted in its right torso letting it send a half dozen daggers into its opponent in hopes of scoring a critical hit on exposed armor plating or managing a lucky hit to the head or a TAC. To further back this up at this range, the Warhammer has an additional two Martell medium lasers, one in each side torso, giving it the opportunity to hit its target further with the reliable, simple damage weapon systems enhancing its PPC and SRM fire. It's important to note that at this bracket, the Warhammer will likely only fire one PPC and begin firing its medium lasers and SRMs in order to have more opportunity to hit and in order to try to either peel away more armor or land more conclusive hits to exposed parts and structures. Should the target get closer, namely to 90 meters or three hexes in game, the Warhammer will typically cease firing its PPCs altogether and switch over entirely to its lighter weapons, which it also has more of. To start with, it has two Magna small lasers, which are great for extra attacks in close with vehicles and mechs alike, even if they are low damage. Finally, the last system, paired with its small lasers, often when fighting armored targets, but also giving it the ability to drown infantry in a hailstorm of rapid expended rounds of ammunition, are twin Sperry Browning machine guns. This gives the WHM the ability to confront and control infantry formations, as well as to back up its close range ability when fighting enemy mechs in close. This is to say nothing of the devastating kicks the Warhammer can land if pushed into melee fighting at the same time. What all this means for the Warhammer is that in every range and against every target, barring the realm of indirect fire, it has effective weapon systems that operate as layers of incoming fire against opponents it's either approaching with confidence or adversaries that it's attempting to keep at a distance. While some mechs specialize in a particular range bracket, the Warhammer has an option to fight in all of them and can do so effectively especially if it uses all of its lethal ranges to engage and pick its opponents apart. The WHM-6R has, for a heavy mech, one of the most dangerous overall setups of firepower in the Succession Wars especially, and anyone who doesn't respect it will quickly find themselves being picked apart at every range up to 540 meters, or 18 hexes. The final category to cover is the Achilles heel of the Warhammer 6R. This is namely its mediocre physical protection, which amounts to 10 tons of standard armor. While its weight ratio to armor isn't horrific, it is just as armored as a DRG-1G Dragon, for instance, a 60-ton battle mech in the same overall weight bracket. The Warhammer is a 70-ton battle mech and is expected to have more defenses, especially since the expectation is that it is more often meant to stare down frightening machines in the heavy weight bracket, or even the light assault bracket. While this weakness isn't the end of the world, it just might be the end of the mech warrior and their battle mech if they are reckless when engaging their targets. What makes the WHM-6R so impressive is its immense array of weapons, covering almost all ranges and acting as a layered web of death for anyone who comes into their view. In many ways, perhaps demonstrating by that alone why it was so beloved by the Black Widow herself. When one sees the Warhammer lumbering onto the field of battle, its particle cannons glowing as its searchlight and targeting systems ominously sweep for targets, they know they may be facing off against a mech so dangerous 
that it's the preference of many of the most noteworthy mech warriors, gunslingers, aces, and killers in the history of the Inner Sphere. It will hammer its opponents of all sizes, from mechs to tanks to infantry, time and time again, until all that remains is burnt metal, torn bodies, scrap, or all three. Should this warlord's axe be ably wielded by a mech commander, and well piloted by a mech warrior, nothing short of the most devastating assault mechs of its era can decisively put it down. With the discovery of new technology, the sun would begin to set on the original WHM-6R, as it would face new designs and refits using spectacular new technologies that could displace its once powerful advantage. This, however, would not remain for long, as the WHM series would be refit and put back into action itself, and just in time. Because the WHM-6R and its succession war cousin variants, as well as the new Star League technology configurations, would soon be among the mechs needed to face down the nightmare that was the clan invasion. The clan invasion ironically being the major investment of forces by the clans who sent the Wolf's Dragoons as scouts decades earlier would crash into the Inner Sphere like a burning spear tip, slamming into the north of the Inner Sphere, cutting through the one-time Lyran Commonwealth, now western half of the Federated Commonwealth, Draconis Combine, and the young Free Rosselhaig Republic. They would even, ironically, among their own forces possess a new, heavier, more powerful Warhammer, showing that their own appreciation of the design wasn't sated with time or advanced technology. These genetically engineered, vat-born warriors would do such damage that the Inner Sphere would never truly recover. But it would survive this initial plight, and in no small measure did the Warhammer contribute to this from the side of the Inner Sphere. Still a machine that commanded attention, and still a weapon that attracted some of the best pilots, the Warhammer would be among the best heavy mech designs at the Inner Sphere's disposal during this era. In 3047, it would be the Free Worlds League, contracting Ronin Incorporated, that would produce the first major refit of the Warhammer using new technology. This was fortunate as it would be exported across the conflict zone to the Federated Commonwealth as a whole, the Free Rosselhaig Republic, and the Draconis Combine. The WHM-7M would itself be a very extensive refit in many regards. First, it would install new electronics on board with newer, more advanced targeting and communication systems. It would also change its engine from the Vox 280 over to the Magna 280, not changing its weight or in-game rules. All these changes would impact the characters in lore but not anything for gameplay purposes. It would use more advanced technology for maintaining a low heat level, upgrading the WHM-6R's 18 standard heat sinks to 18 double heat sinks, giving it an immense sinking capacity of 36. It would need this cooling ability given the new technologies that would be supported for its primary weapons. The standard Don L PPC would be upgraded to the Fusagon Longtooth ER PPC, giving it an extended range from the original design, but also removing the minimum range penalties these systems once possessed, if needed further enhancing the Warhammer's formidable in-close fighting abilities. Twin medium lasers were kept on board, as well as an SRM-6, though the specific brands of these systems would change. This meant that the WHM-7M has a very similar configuration to its original counterpart, though it simply does it better, with better heat management. It's able to fire at a longer range, and is able to better cycle its weapons in close as well, and can fire both of its main cannons every turn with impunity, increasing its punching power overall from just that efficiency. It would strip out one of the traditional machine guns carried on board and replace it with an anti-missile system in an attempt to increase the unit's survivability against incoming missile attacks. The other machine gun remained in place for close-range skirmishing, as well as for anti-infantry defense. Interestingly, it does shed the original twin small lasers. 
The main weakness the WHM-7M had was that it did nothing to improve the survivability of the design beyond its anti-missile system. To start, it lacked a case for its ammunition, a new technology that would save the Warhammer much grief, though the torso is heavily packed with heat sinks, offering it some protection from becoming a part of a massive internally generated explosion. It also possesses the same 10 tons of armor, which against clan forces and advanced Star League era technology is in fact a step down from where it was in the Succession Wars. The WHM-7M is one of the better served upgrade packages from the original development of the Helm Memory Core, as the designers opted to double down on what made the Warhammer an effective fighting machine in the first place. While this means its armor and survivability slide slightly, it gives the Warhammer a better chance to do what it needs to do to hammer its opponents into submission or scrap. There would be several other variants during this time, notably the WHM-7Fs from the Federated Commonwealth, which switched out the SRM-6 for a pair of SRM-2 streaks, as well as installing pulse lasers instead of medium lasers and its machine gun slash AMS. And there is the WHM-7K, which would look much the same, only with two medium lasers, two small pulse lasers, and a tag in lieu of its other lighter weapon systems. These are very similar in many respects during the clan invasion across the domestic production of these houses, simply because much of what the Warhammer was didn't really need to be changed. All would do their best to mitigate heat, all would do their best to improve range and firepower, and all would see themselves thrown into the battle against the clans. The Warhammer was a known quantity to their clan counterparts, even with Star League era technology added to it. For many clan mechs in the same weight category, or even in the medium weight category, they simply outgunned, outarmored, and outranged this venerable 500 year old warrior. Though its performance didn't outmatch its clan peers, as the Warhammer had done to its fellow heavies traditionally, perhaps its pilots did, with the bravest among the Inner Sphere riding in this steel hammer to face down mechs which were objectively 200 to 300 years more advanced technologically than their own mech. They didn't have the advantage heavier designs did, such as the Banshee or the Atlas. These Warhammer pilots would only have the fortune of fighting alongside their unit in carefully staged and performed battles, where they would try to outmaneuver, overwhelm with numbers, or outfight clan battle mechs, often in hopeless situations. All the same, many Warhammer pilots would prove their worth in these refits and even the original designs, fighting with a ferocity against those who would come to subjugate them and destroy their homes, as well as their very way of life. Despite the quality of their mechs, and more importantly, the quality and courage of their pilots, many of these warriors would regularly find themselves left in ruin by their clan counterparts, as would many of their fellow designs to be clear. Many far less worthy than the mighty Warhammer at that. If they were lucky in the after engagements of these futile struggles, they would be ejected from the machine. Or if less lucky, they would be killed alongside their faithful Lord of War, fighting until the end. However, in the end, it would be the Warhammer, with its free birth pilots, who would stand tall in the end despite their struggles and losses, as the clans would be ground to a halt at Tukiyid, and then when the Warhammer strode over the fractured remains of the once mighty clan smoke jaguar during Operation Bulldog. Unfortunately, war, war never leaves the Inner Sphere, even after such great triumphs. The Warhammer would continue to fight, and fight across the face of the Inner Sphere for decades, and do so under the banner of every house just as before. Whether that was during the Federated Commonwealth Civil War, the Blakest Assault, or the desperate death throes of the short-lived Republic of the Sphere as it tried desperately to save itself, the Warhammer was always there. And it is there now, even after the Dark Age, marching ahead along with the technologies that come forward with it. 
The WHM-8R would emerge during the breakup of the Free Worlds League, being produced to fight the war on behalf of the Regulans, though this would widen with time for sale across the Inner Sphere. The 8R would start its life as an atypical take on the Warhammer, originally conceived as being purely geared towards long-range engagements. It would, after tests in the field, rapidly revert to a 8R 2.0 in many respects, as it was retooled to follow the original combat doctrine of the Warhammer, though modernized and upgraded to new standards. The reason for this is not hard to imagine, as the 8R had, in essence, failed to live up to standards in its original form. It would install Endo Steel in order to improve its weight, as well as install 16 double heat sinks, a slightly lower total of tonnage than its ancestor the 7M and 6R. It would retain its standard 280 engine in order to keep up survivability from losing a torso. Though, as an advantage, this version of the WHM series would use extra tonnage to increase its armor, giving it the opportunity to survive more readily in the face of enemy fire, having 13 tons in total instead of the typical 10. Ammunition on board would also benefit from a case 2, increasing the ability for the mech to survive. For weapons, the WHM-8R is well served. First, it retains its original Fusagon Longtooth ER PPCs, which it uses at long range as before to punish its opposition. Once its enemies close in, or once the Warhammer does, it flips to its impressive ensemble of new systems. Twin Magna Mark VI Extended Range Medium Lasers and Twin Magna Mark IV Extended Range Small Lasers give it a mirror of the original 6R's weapons, only with longer range, increasing its biting power at medium ranges with its ER medium lasers and increasing the range of its short range punch with ER small lasers. In addition, it would retain the original 6R's machine guns, with two of them being mounted to double up against close targets and knock out infantry and light vehicles. For the final piece, it has a Shannon SH-67 Streak SRM-6 launcher giving it a more guided strike with its missiles and making them more ammunition efficient and reliable. This would become one of the more common retrofit packages and refits to permeate the Dark Age, all the way into the new Ill Clan era. It is also to take in many ways the two most prevalent designs, the 6R and the 7M, and to merge them into one efficient fighting machine with more armor and more range fixing most of the WHM's survivability issues, as well as improving its fighting prowess. Many mech warriors of the Dark Age and beyond would sit behind the console of a Warhammer 8R, looking over the battlefield as their forebearers did, lording over it as the lords of war they are. The Warhammer is an unforgettable mech in many ways. One of the peak designs of the Inner Sphere during the Succession Wars, despite its shortcomings. In addition, in terms of its appearance, it is very much striking as well. Whether it be from the licensed appearance of the Tomahawk from Macross, or rather the Unseen variant, or whether it be the brilliant redesign by Catalyst Game Labs. Its appearance itself commands the eye to look at it, and to take in its fantastic aesthetic. Beyond its lethal combat abilities, it's no wonder it attracts such pilots as Natasha Karensky, Yuri Naga Kalita, and countless gunslingers as well. The Warhammer is not some random machine, fighting as a thug across battlefields. It is a weapon which not only has survived for 600 years, but has thrived, and in many ways became the standard for what a heavy mech should be. But this machine is only an extension of its pilots the experts who guide its cannons to their targets. It has no moral code of its own. It is simply an extension of the desires of its pilots. Whether it has destroyed the lives of countless innocents or defended them, or heroically fallen against the tide of invaders, is in their skilled hands. The only truth of the Warhammer in all of its forms is that it is a lord of war built to satisfy the wants and needs of a dead empire. Given how well Star Corps and the Star League achieved this, 
it is no surprise that it has survived these 600 years. It remains in the inner sphere as an old soldier, but a dangerous one, having never forgotten or lost its days of glory. It is still the first lord of war. I would like to add I love the Warhammer a great deal, so it's been a pleasure putting this together for all of you. And thank you for joining me here today. If you enjoyed this content, please consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. There is also a YouTube member program that supports this channel and what I do, and I appreciate the support from members immensely. With that, I will catch all of you in the comments section below. Please let me know what you think.